and growing and accepting love. Today, we'll hear the story about Jesus healing a child. Dancing requires that we pay attention to the steps, that we watch for the steps of those who have danced this dance of life before. Those whose offers of healing and hope can lead us to seek and hope and dream. If we're wise, we turn to those who can lead us through difficult times. Imagine now a dreamer in whose steps you would like to follow. How did they choreograph their dance of life? Now imagine yourself following their steps with courage and joy. Uh, please join me in the call to worship. The mic is on. Sorry. Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry for the. Look to the sky. Our heads up. Look around and see that you do not dance alone. We fortify our hearts with compassion and action. If, it, if rain still lingers, open the umbrellas of praise and set out anyway, for we are called to dance again. Holy One, Justice Seeker, Lover of Creation, open us to learn new steps of faithfulness. Give us courage and patience. Come and dance with us, engage with us as we seek you so that we can be risen with Christ and in Christ. Be with us now, we pray, amen. So I want to encourage the children um, to come to the screen or to listen for the story for all ages. I think we have Mackenzie, we have Evie. Do we have anyone else? No. Oh, okay. So today I'm going to tell you the story of Marian Anderson. Marian Anderson was a singer, and she was an African American woman. Now that's not so unusual. We hear lots of African American people sing. But Marion was a classical singer. She sang opera. When she was growing up, and even when she was an adult, no one had ever seen or heard an African American opera singer. Plus, Marion's family was poor, and being an opera singer means that you need a lot of voice lessons, which her parents could not afford. But Marion had a dream, a dream to sing at the Metropolitan Opera something that no other African-American person had ever done. 
So she kept on trying. Marion sang in her church choir and taught herself all she could until she finally found a teacher and some friends paid for her lessons. She said, when you stop having dreams and ideals, well, you might as well stop altogether. She didn't stop. She kept on dreaming and kept on trying. It wasn't always easy. She was kept out of a music, music school because she was African-American. After that happened, she said, I was terribly crushed, terribly disappointed. But holding on to her dreams finally paid off. She became the first African-American to sing in an opera at the Metropolitan Opera in New York. But maybe the best part of Marion's dreams was that she used her accomplishments to work for racial equality, and she did it with her singing. She said that her dream was to leave behind me the kind of impression that will make it easier for those who follow. She wanted to pass her dream on, and she did. Now, many African-American men and women sing opera here and all around the world, thanks to Marian Anderson's dream. Let's close with a repeat after me prayer, which I'll encourage the congregation to join in too. We offer thanks for dreamers true, for all they are, and all they do. Let us become let us become dreamers too, dreamers too. and bring new life, bring new life. To, me and you. to me and you. Amen. Today's first scripture reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 through 13. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you. And on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacles in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known as dying. And see, we are alive as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children, open wide your hearts also. Our second reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 4, 31, I'm sorry, 35 through 41. And on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him, a a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they, woke him, and, they, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. First, I'd like to say Happy Father's Day to all the fathers here. Um, being Father's Day, I thought this would be a good time to uh, talk about my son, Stephen. You know, I think we all face a Job moment in our life. Throughout life, little things happen. My big, biggest Job moment was when my son was born in 1984. And everything was fine. A couple of months, he started having trouble, you know, with this formula. So, you know, probably colic, you know, that type of thing. But then his head started to get bigger. And finally, the pediatrician said, I think you need to go, at the time, Newington Children's Hospital. So I was at work, got the call, went up there, and some things just stick in your mind, you know, even though it happened 37 years ago. And I remember the doctor came in and he took out a pen and he's writing on the sheet that Stephen's lying in the bed. He goes, you know, he says, it's not uncommon for babies to sometimes have a blocked ventricle in their head. It probably just needs a shunt you know, drain the fluid. The chance of it being a tumor is so remote that, you know, it probably isn't that. But we don't have the capability here for a CAT scan at the time. So they sent him to Hartford Hospital. So the neurosurgeons, you know, took him in for the CAT scan. And of course, when they came out, I knew the look on his face. And he said, Sorry to tell you, but we've, you know, we'll, we'll stabilize him, but he has a, a tumor. And at that moment, I, I, you know, didn't even know how to react. And I remember this other doctor coming in. He, he burst into the room, and then and we're in a small room. Stephen's in the ICU, and he, he abruptly comes in. And he, his bedside manner was unbelievable. He says, well, we just can't just go in there right now. It'll be a bloody mess, on and on. And I remember he had the worst breath. And then he, and then he, he said, any questions? I'm looking at him, and then he leaves. And I should have said, would you like a breath mint? So anyway, um, they put two shunts in him. You know, he's, he's just turning like three months old. And they did a biopsy on the tumor. And they were hoping it was benign. And it was malignant. It was an aggressive tumor. And so they had him for a couple of weeks trying to just keep him stable. And the tumor was growing back. And I felt like Job, because I was angry, I was hurt, and I said, God, well, why my son? Why not me? So they finally said, we can't do anything else. We'll help you get him to Boston, wherever you want to go. Well, thankfully, we found a pediatrician, an oncologist pediatrician down at Yale New Haven. So we get on there, he's still in Hartford. We're bringing all his records down, you know, for a consultation. And she looked at it and she says, you know, I could treat him. She goes, but I'm gonna be honest, you might get six months and it's going to be rough on. But she says, you know, I've got a neurosurgeon on my team that I would like him to look at and see what he thinks. He looked at the x-rays and he said, the only way to save his life is surgery. With the understanding, he may not survive 
And if he does survive, he's going to have special needs. There's no, and they don't know how bad it would be. And the tumor was pressing on his, his they thought he might be blind. So, of course, <laughs> we transfer him down there. And, you know, faith, you know, I, I think everybody struggles with faith at times. But this was like a roller coaster ride for me. You know, some days I'm like, well, keep praying. Other days I was so angry that I was just down in the valley. Well, this, you know, talk about miracles. This, this surgeon was six hours. He removed a tumor in, a, in an infant that was probably as big as an orange. And it was in Stephen's right hemisphere. They had to remove the tumor plus part of the brain. So if you looked at a scan of Stephen, he has one hemisphere normal, and then he's got like about a third of his brain. So the thing, you know, during things like this, I mean, you, you just try to get one foot before the other. People say things with good intentions. Before he went to Yale, I was visiting him in the ICU, and on the way to leave, I was about to get on the elevator, and Stephen's mother was holding him with all the, you know, he had shunts, the, the whole, you know, an infant. The elevator opens up, and it's full of people talking, laughing. They saw Stephen, and they just, oh. So I get on, and this woman quietly says, the baby's sick? I said, yeah. He's going to be okay, though. I said, I don't know. And you could tell the young people were uncomfortable. They didn't know what to do. As we leave, the woman and her husband, it was an older couple, he says to me, you'll have others. And you know, it's like he meant well, but that just, so you, you just kind of, try to keep moving. Um, so he survives the surgery and it was like a miracle. And now they're trying to determine, you know, what his needs are gonna be. So he's still in the ICU, but now he's down in Yono Haven. And the neurosurgeons his like top guy, his assistant, is walking with, doing the morning rounds with the interns. So they're all around Stephen and his mother. And of course, the assistant to the neurosurgeon, he's like, wow, look, this is all we did. And look, you know, he's, he's excited that Stephen survived. And one of the interns says, <laughs> He's got half a brain. <laughs> so again, it's like feeling like Job. It's like, how do you keep moving on? So he's gonna, he, he's never been able to speak. Thankfully, he does have eyesight, but he needed somebody with him 24 seven. I, we made the decision that one of us would leave work to care for Steven. I did that. So I left my job and I was a stay at home dad, taking him to all his appointments, take him to his therapies. And he would have to have blood work because he, he immediately started having seizures. And I could tell you how many times I would have to hold him down 
as he got bigger to take the blood and I'd be in the car after bringing him in, putting him in his car seat in tears because it's your son, it's your child. So, you know, I'd be going along, you know, okay, God, you, you know, you're, you saved him, the doctor saved him, but then I'd feel this, this anger and this hurt again. Um, and, you know, try not to go down into the valley. Um, and, you know, the, the seizures, they were, he was on so many different medications. And as he got older, um, it was harder. You know, we'd have his bed on the floor because he could fly right out of the bed. I, I remember in the middle of the night jumping up, running in there to comfort him. And, he, and like I say, the hardest thing for me was he couldn't talk. He couldn't tell me, Dad, you know, this I'm feeling this way or this way. He always said, say, what's going on? You know, he, something's not right. You know, he couldn't tell if he had a stomach ache. So I tried to, you know, find some way of not totally losing my faith and saying, what's the point? And I think what I tried to find is signs. And I think this is what we need to do. Finding signs of God that keeps us from losing that faith. And it can happen through other people, through doctors, through, through a smile, you name it. And also it comes from Stephen. Because some of the things that he had to go to therapy a lot, physical therapy and that. I would have to get him in the car, you know, get him, get him his breakfast and get him in the car, et cetera, et cetera. You know, drive up to Newington and all that. And I remember this one time, you know, I'm rushing around and I got his breakfast and he's got a glass of chocolate milk, his favorite. And, I, and it was almost like his hand went, Poof. I'm like, oh God, Stephen, no. He's, I got to change him. I'm looking at the clock. I get him in a car. I get up to the highway, dead stop. There's like a fatal accident, like right where I would have gone on. I started thinking, well, that was maybe a coincidence. Another time as he got older, you know, we would go visit my mother. And again, you know, he doesn't talk. We're driving along. I'm on the highway. I had one hand on the wheel. And there was an entrance ramp that came on. And he said, I mean, he sat next to me for the ride all the time. He never did this before. And I'm riding along and all of a sudden he reaches over with his hand and he takes my hand that I had on the seat and he puts it on the steering wheel. And all of a sudden this woman just like whoo, cut right in. And if I didn't have my two hands, could have been, and I, I kind of paused. I said, you know, just maybe God's saying, I'm there. So, you know, as far as, there's a good movie, if you haven't seen it. I mean, it, some people say, well, it's sci-fi, but there's a good movie called Signs with Mel Gibson. And it's about a pastor that lost his faith. But the, but the whole thing is looking for the signs of God in our lives. And, you know, sometimes my faith is better than some days. Sometimes I still struggle. I look at faith as, it's like, hanging on to the edge of a cliff. Sometimes you've got all your hands there. Other times you just got one finger. And that's, I think, the struggle. But thank, thank you for letting me share this today.
Thank you for sharing that with us, John. Uh, let's take a moment to share God's peace. <clears throat> May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So we will greet one another with a wave, or in the case of those who are joining us online, by naming those you see. Hi, Mary. Hi, Mike. Hi, Suzanne. All right, so please join me in the prayers of the people. And we will end with the Lord's Prayer. I'm sorry, I don't have all of like, the segues that Ginny has, so you'll have to work with me on this probably a little bit. It's going to get roughly put in there at the end. Um, please join me in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity to bring our burdens to you in prayer and to have those prayers answered with healing, solace, and reassurance. Today, we especially pray for Robin, Pat, Robert, James, Mary, Jeannie, Peg, Howard, Phyllis, Lily, Amos, Suzanne, Stephen, Gary, Jerry, and Michael, McKenna, Alfred, Linda, Rebecca, Susan, Malia May, Jane, Abigail, Beverly, K.R., Thomas, Doris, Ricky, Jessica, Christina. Also for our scout troops camping next week, for Michelle, Grandma Judy, Uncle Tommy, and Blake. And please join me in praying the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. It is not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And I'll encourage you, uh, if you didn't on your way in, on your way out, to leave your offerings at the collection plate at the rear. And Mike is going to play for us uh, the hymn, Guide My Feet. And actually, I think Renee is going to sing it for us. And for the benediction, I'm going to default to the Sunday school benediction, which I heard about 300 times as a kid. <laughs> 
May the Lord watch over me and thee while we are absent one from another. Amen. Thank you.